very warm welcome to the British Library. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Roly Keating. I'm Chief Executive here, uh, and it is an absolute pleasure today to be celebrating the launch this very day of a genuinely unique resource on the open web. Uh, it is, of course, Voices of Science, um, which is the culmination of the first phase, only the first phase, uh, of an epic oral history project, the Oral History of British Science, uh, which is led by National Life Stories, uh, based here at the Oral History section uh, at the British Library. Uh, it comprises, in this early form, already over 100 interviews, uh, comprising about 1,200 uh, recorded hours. These are long, epic, intense engagements um, with uh, some of the greatest living scientific brains and imaginations and personalities. Uh, and uniquely, I think, capturing a generation or more than one generation of scientific inquiry and innovation on a scale rarely done. We don't think there's really a project like this uh, anywhere else, and we're very proud of it. These interviews, like all the best oral history, reveal new insights, often very candid reflections. Once you start talking for hour after hour, it all comes out. Um, tracking triumphs, frustrations, opportunities missed, opportunities taken. Um, and not just the hard scientific career, but the context to the family background, the childhood, the social milieu uh, in which people grew up and which formed their thinking uh, and their intellectual and creative approach. We'll be publishing them uh, in ways that offer many, many different routes to this content. We want this resource to be widely used. So for younger school students, there are short clips, simple text, uh, easy way in, ways in. But equally for, for academic researchers or postgraduates, they'll be able to access the full unedited 12, 15 hour sometimes interviews, whether in transcript form uh, or in recorded form, along in some cases with other material, uh, personal photographs, location videos, uh, or links to other, um, other materials. Uh, it will, as it happens, as I hope you'll see, also showcase, by the way, our spanking new uh, web design here at the British Library. It's quite right that this project pioneers that. In a moment, we're going to show you a, a short film that, that, that I hope brings it, to, brings it to life before we hand to our panel. Uh, but before we do that, I must, we must record our thanks uh, to some of the people at least who have made, it, uh, made this possible, uh, in particular to the Arcadia Fund and to Lisbeth Rousing, who's given a lot of personal commitment to this. Of course, to Oral History of uh, um, British Science team, uh, led by our very own Rob Perks here. Um, to our academic partners at uh, Leicester University, and Sally uh, Horrocks, I think, is here. Uh, and to the Project Advisory Group, led by Georgina Ferry. Without all the support of them and many others, we couldn't have achieved what's been, uh, been put together today. Uh, but that's enough for me. Uh, let's have a look at the project itself uh, in a short 10-minute film. Thank you. I was sent to Farnborough in January 1943 not knowing the first thing about aeronautics or aeroplanes or anything, thinking that I was going to be a civil engineer. Um, in fact, I was very, very fortunate because just before I arrived here um, in January, the, our first jet-propelled aeroplane, the Gloucester E2839, was delivered to RAE Farnborough for us here at Farnborough to make measurements on the aeroplane with this new engine, a turbine engine rather than a propeller driven. And to do that, a little special team had been set up, which consisted of Smelt, a double first at Cambridge, Smith, a Cambridge engineer, um, Miss Fougere, a Cambridge mathematician, and a practical ex-apprentice of RAE called Dennis Higton. Smelt said, you'll never believe it, but we've got what they call a jet-propelled aeroplane. It's one of the secret things that we haven't talked about, but the Germans have got aeroplanes flying without propellers, 
and we've got one and we've made it in England. So I thought, oh, the man's gone mad. Historians of science have been more reluctant than, say, social and cultural historians to engage with oral history. And so they've missed the opportunity, really, to enrich the documentary sources and material sources that they've tended to rely on with the actual accounts of scientists themselves. And this has left history of science in often slightly depersonalised, especially for the 20th century, where we don't have the volume of letters uh, and personal correspondence that we have for 19th century scientists like Darwin or Lord Kelvin, for example. Historians of science are sometimes uneasy with what they call the great men approach to history of science, which is something that an oral history project like ours could be accused of adopting because we have interviewed primarily men uh, and we have often chosen people who were very eminent within the scientific community. But for many of the projects, uh, the people we've been actually been able to interview were the junior people on those projects because they were the younger people and they're still available for interview. So they're not the people who were most well no associated with these projects, but they sometimes feel they're speaking for the whole team of people who were involved in that project. And so we have that kind of cross section across the scientific community, including people who started off very junior, who ended up uh, very eminent and very senior later on in their careers. Oral history allows us to actually get inside the lab almost in real time and get scientists to tell us about what they actually did when they were doing their work, how they interacted with their colleagues, uh, how they maybe didn't get on with their colleagues, how, how personalities were involved in science, how teams worked, uh, how those teams interacted with the people who managed them, uh, with the funding structures. So it gives us a window onto the bigger issues in history of science as well as uh, making uh, giving us an insight into how individuals reacted within those structures. The oral history material that we've collected through the project really enriches our picture of post-war British science. It puts people back in, particularly into big government-funded or industry-funded research projects, which tend to be quite anonymous. So people know about the Harrier jump jet, but they don't know about the people who designed and built it. I think that's our main contribution, is to kind of put those people back in, but also through those people, we've shed a lot of light on big issues that historians of science might already have written about, but haven't had those personal insights into uh, the detail of the processes that were involved. We waited until the blast wave had gone through before we opened the door and went out. And we saw this enormous uh, cloud developing, I must say, compared with previous ones I'd seen, that was quite impressive. Nature does exist, and, it's, and there's some very mysterious things about it. I mean, the most mysterious thing, if we're going to get very deep into this, is that it's intelligible at all. I mean, why shouldn't it be just total chaos? When we started actually making things much, it was we had a, a shed, we built a, sh a shed at the bottom of the garden to do this. <laughs> and that's when I realised that that the right way to do all this was, was to think in terms of rigid plates. Then everything made sense, right? And the whole thing was as obvious to me then as it is now to everybody who learns about it. When scientists are usually interviewed, the focus is often on their career and on their scientific work only. So that's what they're used to talking about and to some extent that's what they expected they'd be talking about when they said yes to us. But the life story or history approach asks them to talk about their whole life, in other words, things done outside of work and things done well before they became a career scientist. And this allows us to see that scientists are more ordinary than we thought they were, which sounds doesn't sound very promising, but what I mean is that it allows us to see that science is a, a kind of work like any other and it fits into a life which is like any other and it has a day-to-day -day structure and it has elements of the humdrum and the ordinary and the just the just doing and so through the life story approach scientists seem more familiar I think to us than they would otherwise be and in that way more interesting. I've become very interested in, um, over the project in the way in which scientists talk about their childhood. Um, they talk about their childhood at the start of the interview but often throughout as well nipping back to it to explain things. And it seems to me that childhood is often used as a way of um, making themselves understandable to others and perhaps 
making themselves seem and feel coherent, if you like. So when they look back at their childhood and they remember it, and they're often helped in remembering it by things like conversations with their parents, photograph albums, diaries and so on, when they look back at their childhood, they tend to pick out particular events that they see as significant or see as being formative, missing out all of the other details and complicated mixtures of things that happened in childhood and just picking out these few things. My brother was given a chemistry set and I was given an electrical set. He became a chemist and I became a physicist. And like all kids, I was interested in fireworks and bangs and crashes. And there was no health and safety whatever in those days. And if you blew your hand off in the course of it, well, that was very unfortunate. And he should have been more careful and, and all the rest, but there was no, no inquest. This project has made a really important contribution to understanding the role of women in, in British science in the years since the Second World War partly through interviews with women themselves, but also through asking male scientists about the women they worked with and the gender division of labour in their workplace environments. And often what men tell us about the women they worked with is actually much more interesting to someone whose research interests are in gender and science than actually the interviews with the women who uh, give us a very different perspective from that of the men that they worked with. Well, I thought it was daft that um somebody would, should be expected to work on samples um, that hadn't been collected by that person because I had done geology because it was a, a field subject and that you needed to sort of get your hands dirty um, collecting the samples and relating to the environment from which they'd been collected. And I was also cross because it was the gender issue that was sort of dawning on me <laughs> really and uh, I thought that was um, stupid too, so I wanted to go f for the reason of seeing it for myself, that particular location, but also going because they shouldn't stop me because I'm a woman. I think one of the real challenges has always been um, sort of firstly giving people an idea that what they think of as being boring and everyday and just that job I did for 50 years actually was probably quite important in the big scheme of things is something that other people are actually interested in has had lots of consequences that people might actually be interested in. There would be scope for another one or perhaps two big computers in the UK and um, three or four in Europe probably half a dozen in the US because they always have big ideas in the US. That was the um, eventual scope of, of our invention, we thought. And I think that's a, a theme which, to me, goes through engineering, whether any branch of engineering, this creativity, this delivery, this, this element that says a bit of my DNA is in that. I have an element of me it's manifested in that building, that aircraft, that missile, that spacecraft. Your success is also driven by the success of others around you. It's not, yes, there's an individual feeling of success, but you succeeded because you did your part, everybody else did your part, and you worked together as a team. We were flying over Istanbul, and I could see the bridge that I'd designed glintering in the sun. And I had no doubt that I'd picked a profession that was worth doing, leaving something that you can see and admire from 35,000 feet. Can't be all that bad. Thank you. I'm now uh, simply going to have the pleasure of inviting to the platform, please, our chair for this evening, uh, Wendy Hall, who I'm sure many of you know is Professor of Computer Science at the University of Southampton uh, and also a distinguished board member here at the British Library. Wendy, do you want to introduce your panel? That was a lovely video, by the way. Nice to see the uh, tables turned on the interviewers. You looked quite uncomfortable some of the time, I thought. <laughs> so, um, it is, I can't, it's a great pleasure to be here tonight. I, um, my career in computing started with, with digital archives. That's what I got so fascinated about. I worked on 
uh, Lord Mountbatten's archive and Winston Churchill's archive, and I've always been fascinated in, in uh, how uh, this wonderful new digital revolution helps us uh, to deal in different ways and, and exciting ways with science. And the history of science has always fascinated me as well. And so it's an incredible pleasure to be here to chair this panel. And we have three very distinguished, very eminent people here. Uh, we're very lucky. I'm going to talk to them each in turn. And then we'll have a collective conversation and try and draw out some common threads from their stories. And then we'll, uh, we'll draw you into the conversation through uh, questions and discussion. So I was fascinated, actually, as I was brought, brought into this project, which I would hugely recommend you look at the website afterwards. And the, there are 100 people there now, 100 interviews there. I was fascinated by the way the project is talking uh, about the childhood, because I've, um, thank you, yeah, I, I've, uh, I've often wondered how I've got to where I am because neither of my parents are scientists. I came from a very simple, uh, modest background in London. I was the first, a baby boomer, the first in my family to go to university. And I've, I really have often wondered uh, where all that came from. And so we're going to hear tonight from uh, your reflections, uh, each of you, on, on where you think you got, you draw your skills from and how your childhood um, influenced uh, you, what became your illustrious career. So we're going in the order, um, <clears throat> the panel to my left here, and we're going to start with Professor John Copland. Now, this is a man I think of every time I fly in an engine with uh, aircraft with Rolls-Royce engines. No, I don't think of you personally, but I do. I am very grateful to Rolls-Royce for what they have done to improve aircraft safety um, and the fact that we get on these planes and. Almost, they almost never fall out of the sky these days. Um, so um, uh, John is currently, he's still very active, chairman and chief executive of High Flux Limited, but he was the chief designer of the RB211 engine and then held senior posts in Rolls-Royce and served as an advisor to the Indonesian government. Oh, fascinating. So John, um, tell us about your childhood. <laughs> All of it? <laughs> no, you've got a couple of minutes to talk about your childhood, and then, then we'll ask you about your career. Well, I, I, I was very fortunate, <clears throat> but there were also a couple of disadvantages that um, elements to it. My father was um, a craftsman. He left school at 13. My mother was well educated and was a secretary and a bookkeeper up in Lancashire. So uh, they worked very much as a team. But there were two disadvantages I had. One is I was born with a hernia, and they wouldn't operate until you were five, when, and the, there was quite a long recovery period. I well remember the operation uh, and the uh, setting there. It was done during the Blitz on Coventry, <gasps> with children dying all around me, so it, it's a very vivid recollection. But the importance of that was that it meant I started school later than most children, and therefore, in a self-motivated way, there was a need to recover. And that meant that you had to get on and do things for yourself. And of course, as I discovered later, it was in a situation where merit counted. So you could win your place forward. The second thing was, it was during wartime, so we used to go to school with our gas masks on. But being Coventry, we had the Blitz, and uh, we had around us machine guns and uh, barrage balloons and so on. So we would collect pieces of aeroplane uh, on the way home from school <laughs> as we walked across the fields. And that actually <coughs> led to an inquiry aspect. Why is this piece of metal so big yet so light? It's magnesium. Oh, that's different. Anyway, so those were important things. Um, thereafter, I, when uh, I was doing rather well at school, but I soon realised as I got a place at the grammar school that others were doing rather better. <laughs> so the motivation was still there. But the other thing was that I took the 11 plus early and only got a place as a fee pair, which meant I was really um, lower than everyone else, but had the opportunity of doing a reset and the benefits of a good education. But to my surprise, the headmaster sent for me almost on day one and said, do you know, um, 
during the wartime, this school had been uh, evacuated into Lincolnshire and it was a barracks. Will you, a 10 year old, please decide what equipment should go into the metal workshop and the woodwork shop? <laughs> well, you don't refuse the headmaster, particularly when he's a double first from Oxford, <laughs> rather a man of great stature and great dignity. And that was another motivational thing, to be trusted at an early age, almost in a disadvantageous sense. And the, mes the, the message was very clear. It was that headmaster, that school, wanted to get the best out of every child, whatever their natural abilities were. Mm. Each one was different. So those who were sporting interest were encouraged in that. Those who were very academic were encouraged in that. But the other important point always is, if you're not the best, then you work jolly hard to keep up with the best. And you know that in the, in the world which is driven by meritocracy, um, which is the world I came into, then you have a chance by your efforts to do better and to thereby find uh, the right sort of place in your, uh, for yourself. But the other thing about that school was it had it worked six days a week. Tuesday afternoons, Thursday afternoons, Saturday afternoons were free, except Saturday afternoon had to be for sport. But on Tuesdays and Thursdays, we visited every single factory in Coventry, Birmingham, and the surrounding area. And you soon realised if you didn't get an education, you could be doing this all your life. And how boring is that? So there was, you know, it wasn't a lesson. It, well, it wasn't a, a structured lesson. It wasn't someone teaching you that it was important to work. It was you could see for yourself that unless you did, then you could be condemned to a rather boring life. <clears throat> We might come back to that because the things to, for today's children to think about there and why we don't inspire them. So how did you become an aircraft engineer? Then? Well, initially I thought that because my <laughs> skills were in the craft area, I would go and be a teacher, but I soon realised my lack of sporting ability would probably limit my career in that direction. Really? So I just... <laughs> just well, because teachers always had to do a, a, a range of things in a school, and, and I didn't see myself being well suited to that. But I really was fascinated by the automotive industry, and even at school I was thinking about um, how do I get performance that's economical for the long run, yet exciting in terms of um, sporting high accelerations, high decelerations and all that sort of thing. And so even as a child, I was thinking about um, hybrid cars and, and that sort of thing um, as a schoolboy. But then I realised, well, perhaps uh, <coughs> the automotive world is, um, is flattening out, very, very wrong assumption. But the aero engine world was uh, very attractive, and so I decided to head in that direction. And from the school, I won a place at Imperial, ch chosen to do aeronautical engineering because it was the most demanding form, or well, one of the most demanding forms of engineering that was being taught in the universities. And Imperial was, you know, right at the top of the pops. And uh, then afterwards, uh, the choice of Rolls Royce choosing me and me choosing Rolls Royce was the one of work ethic, really. Coventry was an area where more, more um, pay, less work, mm. free beer for the workers and so on, and that didn't sit well with me. Uh, Rolls Royce was, you worked until it was working properly and safely and did what you what, Which what is what we're so did. grateful for. <laughs> 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 so tell us about designing the RB211. Well, I, I um, initially was uh, involved in preliminary design, mm -hmm. that is laying the foundations for next generations of engines and so on. Uh, and then got an opportunity to go into the main design area. And I, for a while, um, I ran joint projects with the United States and Germany on very advanced engines with very high thrust to weight ratio using advanced modern materials. But there was always an assumption in Rolls-Royce that the, uh, the difficult we do in our stride, the impossible takes a little longer. But there's a flaw in that. And, and whilst it works in many cases, there are times when you've exceeded what nature allows. So uh, we had a lift engine technology 
small little engines with subsonic aerodynamics being transferred across into great big uh, engines that were going to carry more than 100 passengers each at almost the speed of sound. And it soon became very clear that materials like carbon composites were absolutely wonderful in one direction, but we needed the properties of three directions for the way in which the engine had been designed. So it fell to me, sad to say, to take out a lot of that um, technology and go back to things that we knew. But of course, as they say, the rest is history. It is a very durable engine and it's laid the foundations for the Trent, which is successful. Yeah. And quite interestingly, now um, having started a, 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 a a little company doing high temperature heat exchanges, lo and behold, it's almost full cycle because we're already at the limit of materials in the modern aero engine. Mm. And to go beyond that, we're going to have to cool some parts that hitherto have not been cooled. And lo and behold, in our little company, we have developed the technology not only of how to do the cooling, but also how to make it strong and able to take a combination of very high pressures and very high temperatures together. So, there we are, you see, you've come back, haven't you, to what you were doing in your childhood of picking up those bits of metal. So, did you enjoy the experience of, of the uh, interview and what did it teach you about yourself? Well, the interview was fine. It was a lovely experience. <laughs> <laughs> fine. There's a lovely English word, isn't it? Yes. It was fine. <laughs> well, it was an enjoyable experience, and it was an opportunity to recall things. I don't think I recall more as a result of the interview than I felt was fluent in my mind. But it uh, certainly gave the opportunity to draw some lessons that have perhaps not been there in the subconscious or the conscious world that I lived in. <clears throat> so from that point of view, I found it very, very valuable. And, um, you know, hopefully there are some very important lessons. And some I would pick on a slight disadvantage in childhood, which motivates someone to get back and compete at yes. the top levels is very, very important yes. indeed. And of course, the other really important thing is supportive parents uh, as a partnership, and it's something that my wife and I are very keen on, and that is each doing what we're best able to do in support of each other. And that's such a solid foundation for any child to follow her. That was fascinating. Thank you very much. We will come back to that, your point about tra mm. trauma in childhood and what that mm. taught you. Now, Professor Sir Colin Humphreys, who gives the best lectures I've ever been to. He always <laughs> great demos. <laughs> uh, one of uh, the great men of science uh, in the UK, best known for his contributions to electron microscopy and uh, semiconductors, ultra high temperature aerospace mm. materials mm, um, <laughs> and superconductors. Um, and you have a lot of other interests, Colin, which uh, I think you I hope you're going to tell us about now. So tell us about your childhood. <laughs> right. So I was born in Luton in one of the rougher streets in Luton, I guess. <laughs> and uh, we had street gangs there. And uh, street gangs had air pistols and uh, we were fire at each other. It was really quite rough. And usually it didn't uh, cause blood, but you got these bumps on your mm. face, you know, and then quite painful. And uh, sometimes, it, you know, you would bleed. And I guess if you went to your eye, you would have yeah. been blind. So yeah. it's quite a rough area. And um, uh, I was born, apparently, with my feet pointing backwards. I've never really understood this, but that's what I, my parents told me. So when I was two years old, <laughs> when I was two years old, I had an operation to straighten my feet and point them forwards. And I was in plaster, my legs were in plaster for six months then. Mm -hmm. And then I had leg irons on until I was the age of 12. And so if you went to the film Forrest Gump, then I just looked like the character in Forrest Gump with these leg irons on. And um, I remember being a very sickly child. In fact, I remember I only saw fireworks on November the 5th, I think, one year up to the age of 10. I was in bed all the other years. I had all the diseases you can think, particularly bronchitis, you know, scarlet fever and mumps and, and all these things. And I'm so grateful I'm incredibly healthy now because I think I've done all these, <laughs> I've done all these things, so I hardly get any, any diseases or anything now, so I'm very fortunate. Um, and... Um, my parents really believed in education. My father worked for Escaf Ball Bearing Company. My mother was stayed, stayed at home. 
and uh, my, my parents really believed in education, and we had not that many books in the house, but I had a ch children's encyclopedia, one volume children's encyclopedia, which I just read and reread. I just found that fascinating. And we went to the local Luton Library, and we went very regularly, and I got books out of there, and mainly from the children's section, but you know, sometimes from the adult section, and that was a great resource for me, so going to the library was, was really important. Um, and when I was aged about seven, I went to Luton Museum and saw these wonderful butterflies. It may have been a special expedition, a special exhibition. <laughs> and then uh, my parents took me to London. And as far as I remember, it was by chance, but maybe it wasn't. We were walking along the Strand. We passed a butterfly shop called Watkins and Doncaster's. And um, I was just fascinated by the shop window. So you know, I led my parents inside and we got some leaflets. And, I, found, and I, I saw on display these wonderful exotic uh, moths from Africa and India and so on. There's something called a Takas Atlas, which has a wingspan of 12 inches, just huge, and Indian moon moths and so on. And I found that you could purchase the eggs of these, these, uh, these wonderful exotic moths from overseas. And so I decided I'd do this and breed them at home. And that really sparked my interest in science. So I realized, I thought, these are hatching out in a steaming jungle. So I had to simulate the steaming jungle at home. So I got a cardboard box, and I put, and I was age seven at the time, I put an electric light bulb, quite a low, low, low power one, on, 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 uh, at the bottom of this cardboard box, and a piece of cardboard on top, then blotting paper on top, and I wetted the blotting paper, and I put the eggs on top and turned the bulb on and steam came up. And I thought, you know, this simulates the steam in jungle. <laughs> and then um, I read about the food plants of these butterflies. Um, and, and that was going to the adult section and reference section of the library. And uh, I tried to find food plants in England which were similar to those, similar sort of species to those I had in a native country. And it turns out that privet is quite similar to a lot of them and mm -hmm. apple is quite similar. And so I put these leaves on the top of the blotting paper, and I just had enormous success. And thinking back, it was unreasonably enormous <laughs> success. So, so, you know, one year I breed a Takas Atlas, another Indian blue moth and so on. And um, my parents were, I was an only child, but my parents were very indulgent, so these would fly at night. They'd just fly around the room in big circles, you know, just flapping their wings. And in the daytime, we had net curtains, and they'd cling to these net curtains. Some, and they'd go all around the house, and sometimes, on the front, uh, front room, which faced onto the street, we'd have people knocking on the door because these moths would be clinging to their <laughs> curtains, showing them themselves. Um, so that was remarkable. And I think um, that was a key, I, for me, that was a key part of my interest in science, of having this hobby. And I, I would breed these butterflies and moths from about age seven up to something like age 14 when I stopped. And I'll just tell another quick story about this, because my father was a teetotaler, as my mother was. And so they're very keen teetotalers. But I read that you could attract British moths by forming a mixture of molasses and rum. You put these in a saucepan, and you painted it on the trees in, in a wood. And then you had a normal torch, and the moths would come and settle on the trees, and they'd get drunk, and they'd roll around, and you just had a torch, you just pick them up and put them in. A, you know, so, so, so I said to my father, can we do this? I knew it was a teetotaler, and he said, wonderful idea. So we went, I mean, he bought the rum, and we mixed it up, and we both tasted it, you know, I was about seven or eight, and uh, not a lot, and we tasted it. And so he overcame his sort of, well, I mean, th I think he saw this was in the cause of science, and that was fine. Uh -huh. so, yeah. yes. Well, I've often tried alcohol in the cause of science, I have to say. <laughs> so, 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 so we did this. And, and um, anyway, and then at age nine, I think my father saw that the junior school I was going to really wasn't very good and was, you know, a very rough area. So we moved house deliberately to so get me to a better school. Yeah. And uh, we moved and I went to a school called Denby Rose School. And I still remember the first day we went to headmistress's study and she asked me some questions. And uh, we, we sat down there and she said to my father, your son cannot go in the top class of his year. He has to go in the bottom class because he doesn't know very much. And the school he's been going to really isn't very good. And I sort of sat there and my father said, I'm not leaving your office until you put my son in the top class. And he just sat there and he said it very firmly but politely. <laughs> and I felt incredibly embarrassed. And um, she compromised and she said, we'll give him a month's trial. And at the end of that, we'll see how good he is, right? So I went to the top class and I wasn't particularly good at the end of this month because I was a long way behind, but I just stayed there. 
and uh, gradually, you know, my performance improved. And so we had good science teachers in, there, mm. good maths teacher in particular in this mm -hmm. junior school, so junior, junior school, mm. state school. Very and then important. secondary school. Secondary. So I, I then passed. I was fortunate. I passed eleven plus, and in fact, a lot of people from this class did. Mm. And we had good science teachers there. And the secondary school had a sort of science bias. It was Luton Grammar School at the time. So if you were equally good at arts and science, they said you should go into science. Mm. And if you were good at maths, they said, you should do maths, physics, chemistry at A-level, and I wanted to do biology. And they said, no, if you're good at maths, you don't do biology, you know? So I think the situation has now changed. But um, my head must so, have said the same to me. It's actually. interesting. Mm -hmm. So they steered me in this direction. But, so, yes. so we need, uh, unfortunately, we need to move on yeah, a bit. How yes. did you become a world famous scientist? You know, tell us about well, that, I, I, well, I, <laughs> tell I, us about I, that I, part I, of your I, career I in, think, a, in a minute or two. I don't think I'm a world famous scientist. <laughs> yes, you anyway, are. Anyway. Um, so, um, it was a, a lot of um, f fortunate and, and luck, really, and then making the most of your luck. So, 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 I went from Imperial College, I went to a group that Peter Hirsch had in Cambridge. To, I, so, I went to Imperial College, a wonderful place, right, for right. a undergrad, with <laughs> physics there. Um, and then went to a Cambridge and a PhD with Peter Hirsch, and working with good people, very important, I think. And uh, I did some X-ray diffraction, electron microscopy. Then his group moved to Oxford. I went there to Oxford and uh, started doing more electron microscopy, worked on semiconductors, um, uh, worked with Rolls-Royce. Julia King was in the audience. Uh, uh, we, we recruited uh, when, when I was at Oxford and went to Cambridge. Um, uh, Julia King recruited and um, uh, got involved with Rolls-Royce Aerospace and then started working on a material called gallium nitride. Mm -hmm. I do have a demonstration, I didn't yes, think I did, yeah, but you see, yeah, little on. gallium nitride LED, <laughs> everyone knows what <laughs> these are, yes. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but the research of my group now, we patented it, and Plessy are starting to manufacture these in, in the UK, the first manufacturing ever of LEDs in the UK. So, you know, it's, it's a good story. Good so the story. point is, it's still exciting, isn't it's it? It's very it's exciting. It's still exciting. Yes. And that's, yeah. So, did you enjoy the experience of being interviewed, and what, on reflection, did, did, did you reflect much on did it help you reflect on how you'd got to where you were? Or? Well, it did become, and Tom was a wonderful interviewer, you know, who's just <laughs> relaxed and, and prodded you occasionally. But, and I remembered a lot I'd forgotten and, um, and then saw how my life has sort of fitted together because at the time things look a bit disjointed, but looking back, you can see how one step led to another and mm. so on. Mm. And doors were opened and, and you could go through them. Yeah, so I learned a lot from the interview. Well, we will come back to all this again. Thank you so much, Colin. And now um, to a lady that's very dear to my heart because she has been a fantastic mentor for me and a role model for many women in uh, technology, uh, Dame Stephanie Shirley, um, who uh, is a, um, has, has a, had an amazing life, which we're going to hear a bit about now, um, and uh, started a very humble beginnings in a way, and has become, you know, one of the top, the leading uh, philanthropists in the UK. Um, most, having started work at the post office and got her interest in computing there, I think, uh, she founded the FI group for, um, for getting, creating, opportunities for women to work from home as computer programmers, and went on from there to, uh, f f to fame and fortune, <laughs> um, but she was she has always been um, uh, a role model and a leading force in in society. And she was the first female president of the British Computer Society, um, and uh, also was the founder of uh, the Worshipful Company of IT and so many other things. And and now has her own foundation um, and works on many many philanthropic philanthropic pro Dalham, philanthropic <laughs> projects. She makes me nervous, actually. There aren't many. There are not many people in this world that make me nervous, but Dame Stephanie is one of them. <laughs> I should, uh, <laughs> there, I've admitted it in public. Right, she's also a very good friend, I think. So, um, Dame Stephanie, tell us about your childhood uh, in, in two or three minutes. That's hard. Right. Well, Dame Wendy, my childhood <laughs> um, is, was very, very different. And looking back to family and, and uh, the, the start in life, it, it's a sort of balance between na nature and nurture. Because I was born in Germany of a part Jewish family, 
and really got caught up with all the uh, anti-Semitism um, that was present there. And I came out of uh, Nazi Europe in 1939 on what's called a kinder transport, which was a thousand children with two adults coming out and 10,000 such trains arrived in England. They arrived at Liverpool Street Station and uh, we were classed as friendly enemy aliens. Now, I was a five-year-old clutching the, the hand of my nine-year-old sister, but I was classed as a friendly enemy alien. And I was brought up, really nurtured, by a wonderful couple in the middle of England. Um, so let me tell you about those two sides. Uh, my father was very much a, 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 an intellectual. He had become a judge at the age of 30, which you could do in Germany by examination. My mother had not worked, but she got caught up as a refugee as well, and she finished up, in fact, doing domestic service in England, uh, and then trained to be a teacher. My foster parents, and I am their child, really. Um, I was five. Um, they were quite different. We call them auntie and uncle. And uh, auntie had never worked and uh, really didn't know very much about bringing up children either. But uncle was quite a, a special person. He had started working as an apprentice at the age of 15 or something like that. Finished up as managing director of a very small uh, but quality uh, engineering company. And he was enormously inventive. He was really very innovative. He took out lots of patents on behalf of his company. And I got the benefit of that in that, uh, well, let's try this, he'd sort of say. You hold that and I'll do that. And, and he really gave me that feeling, well, try it. See if you can make it work. And I certainly learnt that from him. I also got a great deal of, uh, um, what's the word I want? I'd like to use the word love, but it's not quite what I mean. But he trusted me, he had confidence in me that I could do something. But they were not academic at all. Um, they sent me to a little convent school who couldn't teach me mathematics. And these were nuns, you know, in, in, in habits. And uh, they had the intellectual honesty of saying, it was a private school I was being paid for, um, this, this child is gifted in mathematics and we can't teach her anymore, so I got a scholarship to another school. And that business of the inability to get the uh, training that I needed, the knowledge that I needed about mathematics, really pervaded my childhood, because it happened again when I really had to fight to be taught mathematics. Uh, and um, eventually I was sent to the boys' school for their lessons in mathematics. And that was a, a good forerunner of the sort of work yeah. <laughs> what was going to happen to women in the work thing. <laughs> so things were very different, especially for, for girls at that stage. And I started work at 18 uh, with the post office research station. And when boys asked me what I did, I'd say I worked for the post office, sort of hoping that they'd think I sold stamps or something, because I didn't <laughs> want to be known as somebody who worked at a research station. Not a very feminine thing to be doing. But um, it took me six years to catch up, really, by going to evening classes, because the school had taught me some pure mathematics, but I needed applied mathematics, I needed some basic physics, all of which we, we got a great. And, it was a wonderful time because I was learning at such a rate. So I'm this mixture of nature and nurture, and w I think I'm mainly nurture. But intellectually, I know that I have a brain that I can extend and use, and I, I, I love to do new things. I like making new things happen. And you can see that in the whole of my career where I've started companies, I've taken them into sustainable um, lifestyle, I've uh, created organisations as much as anything else. And I don't really think of myself as a scientist anymore at all. So I actually argued with Tom, you know. I, I'm a businesswoman, I, I'm an entrepreneur. Um, and then when I came to do the interview, I realised, hmm, yes, I've been around in a lot of these things and contributed, so maybe I am a scientist.
<laughs> well, I'll, I think we'll give you that one to, um, tonight. But the, um, what fascinates me is how you and how anybody has, and there is a science and, and all sorts of other skills in here, take start with, I'm thinking of your, your, your business and entrepreneurial activities. You started with, you know, a tiny company mm -hmm. and you ended up with something that, you know, has made you uh, um, a very wealthy lady and you're now giving all that back to society. But what, what, how did you, how, I mean, you didn't, I can't believe you started out with the ambition to become a multimillionaire. Perhaps you did. Perhaps you, <laughs> how did you, how did it grow? Well, most entrepreneurs, well, many entrepreneurs, me included, are certainly not so interested in becoming wealthy. Um, I was very interested in not being poor again. <laughs> and, and, and that poverty can be quite, quite, quite a motivator for many people. The values that came from my foster parents really allowed me to think, well, what, what is philanthropy? The world is not fair. Perhaps I can help a little bit here, a little bit there, and so on. And so... Because I hadn't had a good basic education, um, I was able to think outside the box and do a lot of new things. Well, why don't we do so and so? And if it worked, we'd do more of it. And if it didn't work, we'd do something else. So very basic um, drive and innovation. But what the trauma of my childhood did for me, I think, is made me realize that tomorrow is going to be different. It's not like today, certainly not like yesterday. And it made me able to cope with change and eventually to welcome change. I do like, you know, I like things because they're new. I like to do new things. And that, I'm sure, goes right back to that five-year-old child screaming her head off in a two-and-a-half-day journey uh, from... Germany to England, you know, what is England? Why am I going there? I hadn't a clue what was going on. Amazing. Um, so you, did, you, I'm assuming you enjoyed the interview and did, how, you're, how you're talking now, was did some of that come from the interview? Did it help? Because you've just, I will do the plug for you. You have a wonderful book out called Let It Go, Let IT, very good pun, Let It Go, which you published last year. So you've got a lot of your memoirs in there. Did you learn any, I don't, when did you do the interview compared to write the book? The book came out last year. The interview must have been a couple of years before that. But we were doing the interviews around the time you were writing the book. Really? Ah, uh, oh, so yes. did it help yes. for that? I mean, did it help you remember things? Did it help you reflect? Well, what I found was looking at my life as a whole, things that I thought were totally disconnected, my philanthropy, for example, quite, quite different to anything else. So it isn't, actually. Well, you can see the link when you look at it over chronologically. Um, and things that it brought together different ideas and repetitions of my history in the family history. It linked my love of learning um, to a number of things in childhood. And it did, it was quite meaningful for me, Tom. It, it was. Um, I thought about it a lot afterwards. I've never listened to it in total. I've listened to the beginning of it. But uh, uh, that was great. I, I thank, and we're going to roll into a conversation now. Let me just pull some of those threads together. Um, I mean, I recently did the Life Scientific with Jim Calhealy, which was a fantastic experience. And that was only half an hour on the radio. But a good interviewer will tease things out of you that you just hadn't thought of or make connections. Um, but you all three, you three of you, have described quite traumatic experiences in childhood. I mean, uh, Dame Stephanie's is startling. But both of you had very difficult childhoods, you know. And um, I, but I had did, I didn't. So we don't, you know, that's obviously not <laughs> from the four of us. You don't have to have had it. Um, but I had a very, very, very happy childhood. But I did have, picking up on things, I had extremely supportive parents who had lived through the Second World War and were determined that their children would have a better education and be better prepared. Mm. And I was so supported throughout mm. my education. Mm. I went to the most fantastic schools and had fantastic science teachers. And I was good mm. at maths and I was told, you do maths. Mm. <laughs> you know, if that's what you're good at, you do that. I, you know, I actually wanted to be a doctor, a medic. 
my headmistress said that wasn't a career for women. So you could be a nurse. <laughs> yeah, I could be a nurse exactly. But no, she didn't say that. She, she wanted me. To. But so you know, the, so what? How, how reflect on each other's uh, thoughts here? I mean, how, the, the... well, certainly, I, I think supportive parents is very, very important. In my own case, there was quite a difference between my father's approach. I mean, he showed extreme disappointment when I got the, um, uh, uh, the um, school certificate at the age of 14. You've now lost your chance for an apprenticeship. Mm. Yeah. My mother's view was, how wonderful. You've got oh, the opportunity yes. to go and use uh, other talents, which will be developed and brought out as a result of aspiring to go on to a university. So, but, uh, you know, in, like so many things, when there's an argument which is conducted on a mutually supportive basis anyway, um, that's very, very constructive in highlighting the pros and cons, the balance of issues, and the appropriateness of one course versus another for uh, particular individuals. Mm -hmm. That was very important. But the, the other thing which I think was particularly important is that the opportunities that the association with my father created. He was very close to his own father, um, and they used to travel together on the very early motorcycles of the day. Um, and I felt that I had that. So again, um, you know, at the age of seven, during the war, uh, the blackboard easel fell over, the uh, broad pegs were broken, so there was a need to replace them. So we had a uh, a, a drum and round bed lathe, screw cutting lathe, treadle operated, which could also do wood turning. So um, he used his strength to work the treadle, while <laughs> I used the, the gouges to make the board pegs. And I, I suppose it's those sort of things that get noted and that then create the next opportunity. In fact, I well remember a headmaster at the grammar school uh, bringing some visitors around. And at the time, I'd just framed 60-odd um, uh, pictures to go in the classrooms. And he commented on the, the work well done. And he said, Coplin, you know what the reward is for a job well done? You get asked to do another one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Colin, you talked a lot about uh, your parents moved house. Mm. So, um, I mean, the, obviously, the, the education and, and pa the parents, your parents, are so important. They too. I think they're vitally important, mm. that's right. So I think my, uh, my father's father was a gardener, and then he you know, went into industry, and then... My grandfather was a gardener. Yes, mm. yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and then he just uh, wanted the best education for me. He just mm. said it was very important. And I was never under pressure, but I always knew that that's what they wanted for me. And that, I think that's so important. If people don't have supportive parents, no, it's so difficult. It's so hard. And yes. the teachers too. But I was, yes. my parents were very supportive. My grandmother, coming back to, to Dame Stephanie's point, when, when I was looking, you know, the, the, the teachers were saying, well, you know, this, this Wendy will probably go to university, which to my parents was complete surprise. They'd never even thought universities, what are they, you know, what, why, why would one of our children go there? And my grandmother said, I, I, had a, I have one brother, and my grandmother said, no, the boy goes to university, the girl goes to secretarial college because she'll get married. And, and they ignored, you know, mm. I was so lucky that they mm. ignored mm. that advice mm. and because that was quite strong in the, you yes. know, when I was at yes. going to school. Mm. So it's... Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's so, so important, um, the, the, the family. And I, I was struck by something you said, John, about how you went out to the factories and you didn't want a boring job. And we, there are so many young children around, well, in the UK today, let alone around the world, who aren't inspired yeah. to do better. I yeah. mean, you know, what's... I don't quite understand why we aren't inspiring well, them. To... <clears throat> we, you see, I, I mean, we have a number of people around us in our family uh, and, and the, in the margins of our family who are clearly very bright indeed and have not benefited from a good education. And they are so frustrated with themselves. They've got no future to look forward to because they've no proper provision for pensions other than the state pension and so on. And they really are quite cross with themselves mm. of mm. having failed in, mm. in that opportunity. Uh, and you know, that was visible earlier on <laughs> in life to, to see you know, the way things were heading. 
And, you know, this was such a nice way of actually introducing it all. Mm. I mean, the, the, the teachers were very supportive. They took it in turns to lead a party of 20 or 30 children around all these different places. <clears throat> And of course, the, the other interesting thing was the, the value of Imperial College here in London in my day. Um, then, you know, you, there's very little accommodation, or was in my day, as Imperial College, so we all lived out somewhere. But that meant you had a, a nice um, uh, a pass for uh, the, the tube. And of course, the mechanicals, the aeronauticals, the uh, electricals, the civils all had events going on. And uh, I became quite active with that. And it cost no money because you just stay on at college and just go on to the next couple of stations to the aeronauticals or the mechanicals. And there you would actually listen to you know, leaders of the day. But the most important point was, you know, in the socialising around those presentations, you got the chance to meet these distinguished people. Mm. And I later discovered that many of them actually remembered you when many years later you go back to talk to them. You know, a classic example was Sir Sidney Cam. He wasn't Sir Sidney Cam when I first met him, but he remembered when we went to see him about vertical takeoff and landing aircraft and the Harrier and all those sorts of things. Uh, and yet, the first time I met him was as a lecturer mm -hmm. at the um, Nautical Society. Amazing. And nowadays, unfortunately, so many of the events which are perhaps more valuable and deeper in gathering together several key uh, experts, but the, even the cost for a student is a major oh. deterrent. Oh, and, and oh. Fortunately, yes. there are still some open ones, but too many of them are now closed for the financial to many people for financial reasons uh, we must we're going to open up in it but uh, dame stephanie before we do that um i mean you you talked about you, you you just didn't you didn't have the education you really needed you couldn't get it so i had a chip on my shoulder <laughs> for years <laughs> but who were you who were your inspirations then i really don't think i had any wendy um from the point of view of values it's people like nelson mandela or mother Teresa. Uh, but as a scientist, I really didn't have any. Gosh. Um, just different, different. One thing I noticed among our discussion, which I'd like to, to bring up, <laughs> Wendy, mm. um, is that we all seem to be in a sort of nascent industry. I mean, I, mm. I really mm. was so lucky. I was going to be the world's greatest mathematician and solve something called Fermat's last theorem. Mm. And I didn't stand a chance about that. But the computer industry was there, and that needed mm. mathematics. Mm. And so I started very early in the 50s in the computing industry and was able to make a real contribution and eventually convert that after 25 years into some sort of money. <laughs> well, you were, yes, I mean, that is another thing, actually. I'm, we're we're going to open it up now, but are, you, are we going to put the lights up for... I don't know. I don't know if we've got the time right. I couldn't see you. Are we about <laughs> the right time to open it up? Yeah. But I was just going to... Oh, I forgot. The, the other thing about being... Um, being a pioneer is you have to be at the you were at the beginning of something mm. you can't by definition you can't be a pioneer in it. so it's it's uh i mean one of the things i often talk about is when i was beginning to do work on putting videos and audio and text on computers and i was told very firmly by one of the senior professors at southampton that this was not computer science and there was no future for me in either computer science or southampton <laughs> if i didn't get back to doing something that was real computer science and it's that sort of sticking to your guns and decide you know knowing that of hoping that you're right and and they're wrong that's Yes. That's part of what gives you that lift off, yeah. isn't it? It's recognising the beginning of something. Yes. But it's also no. a question of sort of learning to follow the science. I mean, at the moment, I'm working in medical research by funding a lot of medical projects. Um, but you have to follow the science. Mm. Mm. No use wishing it was this <laughs> or that. <laughs> right, now, we're going to open it up. Um, so, I guess, hands up. Um, I can just about see you. Um, who would like to we go first? Right, that hand went up over here. Can you could you say who you are and introduce yourselves to everybody? <laughs> Hello, I'm oh gosh, I'm Colin Brown. I'm a mechanical engineer, um, and and I'm getting the uh, feeling listening to you that 
Um, it's not that many of you had a burning ambition, really. You didn't really know exactly what it is you wanted to be. You were more very much about the way you were going to go about each day. And as a result of that approach, you've achieved what you've achieved. So I'm really asking a question about ambition. At, at oh, the one. age five, did you want to become what you are now? Uh, or actually, is it really pretty random where you've ended up? Is that to me? Oh, well, oh, we can all, all answer you, that. that. You go first. I think all of you seem well, to Well, to me, follow. it was very, very firm. I'd had this trauma, and I was taken in by England. I became a patriot, and so I worked on government committees, starting to manage science and so on. But basically, I wanted to make mine a life that was worth saving, and it really drove me very much to do something to, to justify my existence. Colin and your butterflies. Mm, so, yes, so I guess I really wanted to be a biologist, and I failed, really. So, yes. But, you know, it was, uh, I think having a scientific hobby for many people is important. It's an important route into science and engineering. Yeah. I guess in my case, it was, it was more um, happen chance. But uh, certainly, I felt from a very early age that that creative approach could actually make a difference at whatever you were doing. And really, um, each time you took a step, you could see, well, there was another step to be taken. And that was valuable too. And so one was constantly searching around for inventions that would take you in the right direction. I soon learned, of course, that many of your bright ideas aren't so bright after all. And living with yourself, having put forward a few silly ideas, <laughs> takes a little bit of courage. But, um, I think it was a oh, really recognizing when when you well, have well, sure. made a bad idea and admitting yeah. to it and changing is well, very important. That's right, and often you actually learn <clears throat> from your failures. It's a bit like a child yeah. learning to walk, isn't it? You, know, you spend an awful lot of time falling over, but you soon learn mm. what not to do and mm. what is what, what are the most mm. important steps. So it was a succession of steps in my case. There was no burning ambition to be the greatest. It, it was indeed. Um, a burning ambition to make a difference for the task immediately ahead. And, of course, yeah, the first time you're able to do that, for example, um, there's an apprentice in Rolls-Royce uh, there for a few days, and um, one of our distinguished engineers came to, said, came to me and he said, look, you're fresh from college, um, we've got this embarrassing problem, the lightning, um, this very spectacular twin Avon-powered uh, Mark II aeroplane. It, it can't relight its afterburner um, at, at any altitude. Um, all that seems to happen, well, you know, it'll, it'll light, it'll run, um, but not at high altitude. So I soon realised that actually when you're trying to send fuel under pressure into a pipe that's glowing red hot and has got some tiny holes, that the volume flow through or the mass flow through is, as a vapour is massively less than what it is <laughs> as a liquid. And all that was happening was it was flashing off. So a little bit of insulation um, in the form of a few um, stainless steel strips welded on solved that problem. But then, of course, once you've done that, you get asked for the next one, and the next one, and the mm. next one. <clears throat> <laughs> but one of the, the great things about Rolls-Royce was that it did use its apprentices wisely like that. Uh, and of course, any successes was good signals to the company about the merits of who they've chosen. But it was also comforting to yourself to know that, gosh, I've been noticed for doing something, and therefore perhaps I can do something more. We've gone off your question a bit, but they did. <laughs> when I was five, I, I did want to be a nurse actually before I, because <laughs> uh, that's what girls did. And I, the thing I knew, I was organising. But I had my little brother and his his um, friends all lined up in the bed, you know. So I was the nurse mm. going around. Everybody had to take acumycin because that's what I was given when I had scarlet mm. fever. As I can remember, <laughs> organised. I've always <clears throat> organised everybody. Right, another question. <laughs> yes. Oh, be behind you. There's someone from over here needs to ask one. <laughs> Anyone over here want to put their hand up ready? Come on. Um, Flame yes. Glenn. Flame Gland. Flame Gland um, Information Systems. Um, I wonder if any of the panellists uh, had the same experience as I, that reflecting on our interviews, we see 
I omitted certain things. I gave the wrong emphasis to certain things. If I were doing it again, I would do it rather Ooh. differently. <laughs> <laughs> Keeping much the same, but even so. That's a very good, interesting question. So they don't let you change it, do they? I don't think I'd want to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that was a short answer. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Would it be different if you did it a second time? Well, yes, one has learned, one's yes. life has moved on, and there are bits that I didn't know was were going to happen, and I can see myself moving in a different direction. But um, who knows? Um, what I have become very good at is harvesting from my errors. I make lots of mistakes, but I harvest from them, I learn from them. And I think this is the point yeah. that you were making, really. You, you, you learn from was it, mistakes are the portals of, of tomorrow or something. There's some good quotes there. But um, I think life just changes. How you view things changes. And my memory has gone. So I would have to have much, I would have much more problem remembering names and things like that. Mm. Uh, Colin, did you want to change anything? Did you, did you, on reflection, would you have changed things? Are you? I remember thinking afterwards, there may have been a few things I might have said differently, but I now can't remember what those were. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I wouldn't want to change anything. I mean, you know, you, you, when you live in the aero engine world, um, you really do strive to be very accurate and honest mm -hmm. with the laws mm -hmm. of natural science and mathematics. And any deviation from that causes a lot of trouble and I always think of it in terms of if I don't get this right on this aero engine I could kill somebody exactly and <laughs> I, don't, I, I really don't want those on my watch and, and I think that's that's true about how you conduct your life and how you would conduct an interview in terms of being straightforward mm. and we have a hand up here and then a lady there in the middle that's we'll be getting close to time then will we how are we doing Michael, <clears throat> Michael McIntyre, I'm one of the interviewees in the Climate and Geosciences section. Two things. One, a footnote to what's just been said. I very much appreciate that the British Library allowed me to put clarifications and corrections into my transcript. So I have the best of both worlds, Ooh. really. <laughs> it's now readable and reasonably coherent. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing is... is, is What's been touched on several times, the uh, way one thing leads to another in creative work, the element of luck, in whether it's science or entrepreneurship or practically anything where you're doing a good job. Um, and there must be people here who are also concerned with science management and funding. And the th one thing that's bothered me throughout my career is the fact that anything at all I've done that had turned out to have any importance was without exception something I could not have applied for funding beforehand, because of course it always involved the unexpected. Mm -hmm. yeah. Would you like to comment on that? Isn't it the, the, the joy of science is those unexpected things though, that sort of suddenly realizing that you're the first to know something or the first to appreciate something, it really is thrilling. Yes. Alan, to me yeah. anyway. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. But try telling that to a bureaucrat. Just <laughs> <laughs> to say everything in advance. What you're going to do? Yeah, yeah. It, it often makes a nonsense of the, the business cases that the accountants want to see, where you have to make judgments and predictions about what the sales will be, when you're actually breaking new ground, and all you know is you've got the the best mousetrap out in the world <clears throat> but what you don't know is how well it will sell but you do know who your first customers are you do know what the sensitivities they have and what they really expect from you and really that's the more important point it's the the one that's the real driver but it isn't the one that raises the funds <clears throat> mm. colin one yeah I, well i think you need a mixture of both so i think i would reserve funding for Blue skies research, really important, ring fence that, and give it to the best scientists and say, do what you like with it. Mm -hmm. And um, 
Uh, but I also think there are broad areas which are important, which are of national importance, which you also need to focus on. So aerospace has been mentioned, and we've got, we've got these great companies, British Aerospace and Rolls-Royce, and we know that Rolls-Royce wants engines which will consume less fuel and uh, be more efficient and have fewer emissions and so on. And these are broad areas it's good to focus on as a country for our national economy. So I think you do need you know, that sort of approach, as well as a ring fence in the blue skies, and protecting that is very important. Um, yes, the lady in there. Leanne Coleman, I'm Head of Science here at the British Library. Um, it's been really wonderful to hear your stories, uh, but I'd like to hear what, what advice you would give to young scientists starting out today. Shall we start this end, John? Yes, I, I think <clears throat> the most important thing of all, and I think we've deviated from it too much, is in fact um, science and maths and, and, uh, and science properly um, as proper subjects, physics, chemistry, biology, and those sort of things. I think those are really very, very important indeed. And uh, oh, the uh, thing that you need to associate with that, though, is a meritocracy. We're not all going to be the greatest scientists, the greatest mathematicians. We need a mix of skills. Yes, there are some people who ought to go away and do practical things, but if you're going to get the maximum effort, the maximum value, if you like, for UK PLC, you've got to engage the capabilities of the people you've got. And we're not all going to be um, processed through a university doing um, different degrees. Some of us um, will be very good at that and should be engaged in that sort of direction. But a good foundation in maths and, and natural sciences um, some motivational things are important. Good um, men mentors. Um, very fortunately, and certainly in my generation, we had access to a, a, a number of them. And they were, you know, at one level, very senior um, people who were very much looked up to, but they were also very ordinary human beings in engaging with young people. And so the mentoring is important too. Mentor is hugely important. Colin? Yes, so I think I say to um, schools and school teachers, um, emphasise STEM subjects more because that's where the mm. jobs are going to be in the future. And I mm. think that you know jobs in mm. lots of subjects will shrink as they are now, but for mm. STEM subjects, so th mm. these are where the jobs are. And uh, the other thing is to have a vision and follow mm. your vision. Mm. And I went to China you know, fairly recently, and I spoke to Chinese people in universities there, and I think 80% are in science and engineering, and I spoke mm -hmm. to lots of students, and the, I said, why are you doing science and engineering? And the main answer I got surprised, but they said, we want to be famous. <laughs> and, I, 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 and, and, and I thought, well, you know, all these Chinese, they want to stand out, discover something, have something maybe named after them. But they, they had a vision. You know, well, and I that, thought it was because yes. they, they, they yeah. think it's the, they're going to get good jobs. That's yeah. what I thought. Yes. But to be well, famous, that's, that's an interesting, interesting answer. Yeah. Yeah. Dame Stephanie. Oh, there's so many questions, really, really here. Um, one of the things that women worked for in, in my generation uh, was the right to be average because the first few women were breaking through and I was the first woman this and the only woman that but the right to be average is a very important part of democracy and women have really battled with that when you come to trying to advise young people and I can learn as much from them as they from me um, it, it's a question of realism what is what is realistic at the moment, the government is encouraging a lot of people um, to start new businesses and giving small grants and all this sort of thing, very worthy in some. But they're quite unrealistic in the main. Nobody actually sort of says how hard it is to grow a business, how many years it is before you can even draw expenses. Yeah. And the sheer, um, it's unrealistic to think, start a business and you'll be very wealthy. Mm. <laughs> um, I think at, I can see Rob standing there, so it is time to finish. And actually, there is a nice reception out there, so we're all <laughs> going to go and have a nice drink. Um, I would like to say, before I hand over to Rob, that um, it is a huge privilege to be um, involved with the British Library and to be able to therefore come and, and, and take part in events like this. Um, it's been also a privilege to chair this illustrious panel. They've been brilliant tonight, and I'm sure you'd like to thank me. Uh, to, to, to <laughs> <laughs>
Join me in thanking them. Thank you. Oh, lovely. It's been a long day. Wendy, thank you. You did a great job, uh, I think. Um, I, I, the privilege for me has been to, to lead the team behind this. We've heard a lot about teams um, tonight, and um, it would be awful if I didn't name check some of those people. But I'm, I'm also here um, to tell you that there's food and wine outside, and I hope you'll, uh, you'll join us for that. But also importantly, to meet the team and some of the interviewees that are here, and importantly, to take a closer look at the website. Um, but in fact, uh, perhaps for the first time ever, I think, in the British Library's history, um, the website is actually cross-platform. So it's the first website that's gone right across all um, different devices that we have at our disposal nowadays. So uh, in your goodie bag, you'll find a Wi-Fi password. And um, if you've got a smartphone or a tablet, then um, you can, without even going outside, you can look at the website. And we're very proud that we've managed to launch, in, in other words, not just one website, effectively three websites uh, this evening, because they all take uh, a different amount of design and, and, and different demands on them. So we think it's going to reach far more people than just a standard PC website. So I hope you will have a chance to have a look at it on tablet and, and smartphone as well. Um, now, some, some quick name checks. Um, as I say, uh, none of this you can do on your own, and you have to involve large amounts of people. And it's been going on, the project itself, as you know, it's been going on for four years. We've been working for 18 months, I think, now, just on the website. Um, and it's been a challenge, and it couldn't have done it without my colleagues. So I would like to thank the Oral History of British Science team. And that's Sally Horrocks has already had some thanks, but she gets another thanks from me, who's been a fantastic academic consultant. And before her, Tilly Blythe from the Science Museum was very um, inspiring in the early parts of the project. Um, our two interviewers have done an amazing job. Uh, they've spent most of the time staying in dodgy B&Bs, um, not always dodgy B&Bs, eating unsuitable food, but generally on the road, traveling around the country, uh, interviewing our interviewees. They've done a fantastic job. Uh, video cameraman Matt Caswell, who's actually been filming the event this evening, um, he has done a great job um, on location um, doing the filming side of the project, which is a subsidiary side, but I think an important aspect of the project and certainly a new departure for us within the oral history department. And then uh, my uh, team have worked behind the scenes on the archive and web content side. So that's Ellie Miller, Steph Baxter and Emily Hewitt and um, for organising this evening. It's her last day with us because she's gone off to get um, a real job somewhere. And that's Hayley Moy, so thank you all. Uh, the BL web team have been fantastic and you probably know they're based both in London and in Boston Spa in Yorkshire. So we've spent a lot of time conference, video conferencing up and down um, and a certain amount of travelling up and down um, the M1 and um, on trains. And that's Adrian Arthur and his team. I'll quickly name them Liam, Donald, Andy, Rob, David and James and Adam Simmons. Um, has been great as um, uh, the person behind our new CMS, which we procured a new content management system in the middle of the uh, process of doing this. Um, our advisory committee for the project have been really outstanding, um, and uh, John Agar and John Lynch in particular I'd like to thank. Uh, they were glamorously known as stakeholders, but I regarded them more importantly as voices of reason at stressful moments during the project. And finally, of course, all of you sitting in the audience who were interviewed, um, wh whatever we do and however much money we raise to do these projects, and that's not always straightforward, if people don't agree to be interviewed, then we don't get very far. So thank you very much for all of you who agreed to, to, uh, uh, to put yourselves through 12, 15, 20 hours of close questioning, um, sometimes over months, and in one case, over a year. Um, our oldest interviewee, you might like to know, was 94. Um, our youngest was 59, um, which sounds sort of young to me nowadays. Um, and our longest interview was 27 hours. The average was 12 to 15, but um, if you're wondering who any of these oldest, youngest, longest are, then you'll have to look at the website. <laughs> 
Uh, now, the, I think it would be appropriate to um, dedicate the evening to those interviewees um, who were included in the archive, but who sadly died um, uh, during the project. They're on the website, you can look at them, and I thought I'd just quickly name check them. Uh, because in a sense, their absence reminds us just how urgent it is, the job that we're doing, which is to interview people uh, before they're not around for much longer. So I'd like to name Russell Coop, Alan Cottrell, Joe Farman, Dennis Higton, George Hockham, uh, David Jenkinson, Norman Smith, and Maurice Wilkes, of course, all of whom are included in the archive and sadly not able to be with us tonight. So I hope this does remind us how we want to carry on with this project. We're keen for further funding. If anyone's got any ideas, uh, the chairman of National Life Stories, Sir Nicholas Goodison, is sitting here in the front row. He's, he's happy to take checks um, or to any suggestions you may have for further funding. Please enjoy the accommodation here at the British Library. Enjoy the facilities and enjoy us for a glass of wine. Look at the website. And thank you very much for coming. And thanks once again to the panel. Thank you.